السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, We are on page 11 page 10 Alhamdulillah I think we did the Sunan of prayer and then if you want a book it's in the back we have extra books in the back inshallah um, but if you don't plan on coming back make sure you leave it <laughs> okay uh, alhamdulillah I think we did the Sunan of Salah so we are going to begin with the Hayat of As Salah Bismillah read for us So he says the hayat of salah are 15. Hayat here, what it means is when we went over the sunan, those are the things that if a person misses, he has to perform sujood al-sahu for it. That's what it is. These ones are the extra sunnas that a person should do in salah. The ones that he has listed, if somebody were to miss them, they would not need to make sujood al-sahu for them. And the number he chose to just give us 15. In reality, the scholars, some of them count all the way to 500 hayats in salah. So many hayats that they add in trying to follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But for him, he brings 15 here. And these numbers will, will, will always change, not just from one madhab to another madhab, but even within the madhab, when you read another book, like if we were to do another Shafi'i text, like an intermediate level text, what will happen is this, these numberings will not be the same. The author here, he felt like for the beginning student of knowledge, what he should know, or for the one that needs to know the rulings of prayer, the hayat that he needs to focus on are these 15 that are here. So he says there are 15 of them. The first one is رَفْعُ الْيَدَيْنِ عِنْدَ تَكْبِيرَةُ الْإِحْرَامِ It is that when a person... Ah, So, so yeah, we'll, we'll say, um, uh, well, let's just say the other sunans of prayer. Okay. Because even for the sunan, even though here he calls it sunan, like in, in, in the madhab, we don't refer to them as sunan. We call them as ab'al of salah, like portions of the salah. And then the hayat, hayat are the ones that are over there of salah. Ah. Someone's asking if you zoom in the salah. Oh, it is. Okay, it's still let them in. Can everybody on Zoom hear me? Assalamu alaikum. They can hear me, hopefully. Okay. Okay, perfect. So he says the first one, it is that a person raises their hands at the time of takbiratul ihram. Here, I don't think we need to get into where a person raises his two. But we'll say the best is to raise it up to the ear of a person with the fingers facing outwards, with the palm facing outside. So it would be this. In the madhab, there's also one of raising to the shoulder. So instead of going here, it would be going here. Whenever you hear the language talking about the hayat of salah, what you should try to do is try to implement them sometimes. So for example, sometimes the hands should go here. Sometimes the hands should go here. Also, the moment in which you raise the hand is different. There are some that say that you raise it with the statement Allahu Akbar. So you would go Allahu Akbar. And there are some that say you raise it after. So you would go Allahu Akbar and then raise it. And then there are some that say you would say, you would raise the hand and then say Allahu Akbar. So you will go Allahu Akbar. 
All right. But saying it at the same time is, is uh, what we are going to do, inshallah. So that is the first hayat of salah. The next one, it is the raising of the hand and the ruku'i wa raf'i min. So before you go into ruku', raising your hand to the same place that you raised it to when you did takbiratul ihram. And then when you also come up from, uh, when you come up from ruku' itself, you also use the, the hands. Ah, question. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the raising of the hand in ruku' and in sujood, uh, major the the jamhur are that in all of the places of takbir we raise our hands except in the place of sujood, and then our brothers from Ahlul Ahnaf only raise it at the time of takbiratul ihram, and no raising after. But in the Shafi'i madhab, at every place except between the sujood, you do not raise your hand. But every time you say the takbir, there is the raising of the hand. Then he says, الشمال, and then it is the placing of the right hand on the left hand. So when you, after you said Allahu Akbar, the placing of this to here. Now again, the, the, the places of where the hand is placed is different. Um, and even the way that you are going to hold it is, is, uh, is, is also different. For us, what we are going to say, the madhab is that you hold it between, like between the ribs, where at the top they come together. So right over here, you would hold the hand. So what the place between the ending of the chest and the beginning of the stomach is where you would place your hand. Um, and you would take the right hand over the left and there would be a grabbing of the hand for men and a placing of the hand for women. And he'll mention when we get down um, later. The other thing is what tawajju. That obviously uh, the face is facing the right way. Wal isti'adha. And then also the seeking of. Uh, uh, what is isti'adha? A'udhu billahi min shaytan al-rajim. That as soon as takbiratul ihram, before surah al-fatiha, there is the seeking of uh, al-isti'adha. The next one. Wal jahru fi mawdu'ihi. That raising voice, raising voice at the places that a person is supposed to, will say, recite out loud. So Surah Al-Fatiha, the other surahs, Takbir, um, the, the places we raise our voices and also the times that we raise our voices. And then also being quiet or moving silently in the times that we are supposed to be silent. So in our ruku', in our sujood, in our in the du'as that we would do in the beginning of Salah, before reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, um, in at tashahud in uh, the, play, the, the sitting between, uh, the sitting between uh, the, the two sujoods. In those places we would keep, uh, we would keep quiet. Now, in the Shafi'i Madhab, when they talk about quietness and out loud, they have a very interesting conversation. The first one is what, what we consider jahri is, is the people around have to hear you. What the Shafi'i Madhab considers like a salah that is sirri, you still have to hear yourself. So there's a hearing of yourself that you must do when you are praying salah that are silent. Now this hearing obviously is going to be different for everybody, right? Somebody could be reciting, for example, like, I can hear myself. Somebody's next to me might not hear me. But in my, some might take it to where, and like you'll see this sometimes where the people recite Surah Al-Fatiha inside, they do it a little bit, uh, a little bit louder to where you hear them reciting um, Surah Al-Fatiha. But what it is for us is, um, what it is is uh, you say it to a place where you could hear yourself. You could hear yourself if you could move your lips, if you could move your lips, not just your tongue, that would be better. But again, actually, I forgot to mention something. Let's go back a few steps. Uh, hayat, when we talk about hayat of salah, if you see anybody doing any of these 15 that are mentioned, they do it differently, we mind our business. We mind our business, we don't talk about it. We don't say, let me go and correct them on these things. 
So if a person comes and doesn't place the hand where he should be placing it, doesn't place it where he should be placing it, we're not going to tell them, hey, the, the hand placement is wrong. Nor are we going to tell them if they don't raise the hands going into ruku' going into sujood, we're not going to tell them, hey, there's something missing, which is different than the, uh, the fara'id that we talked about, the pillars of salah, where we have to tell them. And those generally do not, are not different from one madhab to the other madhab. So if somebody is leading us in salah, and he forgets, for example, to read Surah Al-Fatiha, brother, salah is over, we have to tell you, and you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And this goes for everybody. But if somebody comes and he decides that, um, you know, I'm not going to raise my hand after ruku' or I'm not, or even the, uh, the ways that they would recite is not loud enough for us to hear. We are not going to go to them and say, uh, hey, your salah is batil, uh, your salah doesn't count, you need to go fix it. Tayyib, um, so that is there. Um, and then uh, the other one is uh, for a person to say ameen, to say ameen, at the end of the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, from the Hayat of Salah. Some of these things, like this Ameen, we have to be very careful. In, if I am praying by myself, it is from the Hayat of Salah. So if I don't say it, my Salah is not broken. But if I'm being led by somebody, and they say Ameen, the Imam says Ameen, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to follow the Imam. So from there, it gets upgraded to something else. To not hear. Here, I'm, I'm praying by myself. I say I mean or not, does not affect the level of my salah. But it is from the Sunan. But if the Imam is doing it, we have to follow them. In their saying of I mean or in their absence of not saying I mean. So if they don't say I mean, we also shouldn't say I mean. The other one is, وَقِرَاءَةُ سُورَةٌ سُورَةٌ بَعْدِ الْفَاتِحَةِ that a person recites surah al after Surah Al-Fatiha, a, uh, a surah after. Obviously here the surah doesn't mean like an entire surah. And then that, this, this is, you know how uh, some people tell us that uh, you have to read at least three, th three verses, three ayahs. That is the smallest surah. Huh? Like the smallest surah in the Quran is three verses. So they say from there a person needs to at least recite after Fatiha, three verses. But here we'll say any reading suffices, even if it's one ayah, even if it's two ayahs, even if it is not reading, right? even if it's zero ayahs. Then he says, Again here, uh, going into sujood and coming up from sujood. Going into sujood and coming up from a sujood. So when you go all, that takbir before, well, from standing to going down, and then when you come all the way back up doing, uh, uh, takbir and the raise it, the, the, the Allahu Akbar. Then the other one, uh, the statement, Sami Allahu liman hamida, Rabbana lakal hamd, um, when you are coming back from, from ruku'ah. You should say it even if you're praying by yourself. But if you're praying with the Imam, you don't say, uh, Sami Allahu liman hamida. You say, Rabbana. Won't do anything to it, inshallah. So when you by yourself you would say both of them. But when the Imam says Sami Allah liman hamid, you would say Rabbana Lakal Hamd. The other one is what tasbih fi ruku'i was sujood. making tasbih, and they're two different ones. In ruku' and in sujood. The one that we do in sujood is what? I mean in ruku'. Subhanahu Rabbi al Azim. How about in sujood? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. These, these are both forms of a tasbih And these are what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Kalimatani khafifatani ala al-lisani, thaqilatani fi al-mizani, habibatani ila al-rahmani, subhanallahi wa bihamdi, subhanallahi al-azim. Subhanallahi al-azim. Subhanallahi al-azim, sir? Subhana Rabbi al-azim. Kalimatani al-azim. Not the same thing? Very close. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Oh yeah, this is Subhanallah al -Azim. Okay, no, khalas, ignore that. <laughs> so, 
because it is from the hayat of salah, you could increase from the tasbihat that you would do inside of it. And even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his would not be, again, the sujood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the ruku' were very long. So his ruku' would not just be a constant repetition of Subhana Rabbi al Azim or Subhana Rabbi al Ala. There would be other things that he would say. We should look those up and decide. Let me add a few of them into my sujood and into my ruku' the moments I make them longer. Uh, and then he says, after now he talks about the sitting. He says, is that you are going to be putting your hands on your thighs when you are sitting. So when you are sitting, both of your hands needs to go on the left goes on the left thigh, the right goes on the, on the right thigh. And then he says, you are going to be holding, uh, like letting go of the, the left hand, opening the left hand. So the left, the left hand would be open. And then the right hand, he says, what does he say? You are going to grab it or you're going to clasp it, except for the finger that points. When you, and then, فَإِنَّهُ يَشِيرُ بِهَا مُتَشَهِّدًا And then you are going to point with it at the moment that you say, أَشَدْ وَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And in, in, in the, in, when you are here, the, this finger, do people do it differently? Some people do it like this? Some people do it like this also. Uh -huh. Some people like this, huh? Yeah. MashaAllah. That, that one, that, Abdul Qadir, I've seen that one. That one is crazy. Sir. You've seen this one too? Yeah. I've seen some people do like this. Okay. Hold the whole time. Just hold it, huh? Okay. Some people do that. MashaAllah. Some people do that, huh? So, in the Shafi'i Madhab itself, okay? Just to show you like, you know, the position of the finger. There are seven different opinions on what the finger should be doing when you are sitting in tashahud. The one that is like uh, the majority opinion is the one that he describes here. Is that a person holds the, the he holds the, he collapses his fingers. He lets the, this go out and then he would, like, he would put it like this, just regular. So he would go like this. And then the moment he says, Shadu Allah ilaha illallah, he would point with it. Right? And this is, there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari from Abdullah ibn Umar. But also for all of the other ones, the other seven that are mentioned, uh, just in the Shafi'i Madhab. So forget even going to other madahib. Um, there's one uh, hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar that a person should go like this. So one, like this. And this is the striking of what? And the striking of the shaitan, right? So go like the striking of the shaitan, and so on. But again, the, the one he gives here will go with it. You just keep it straight, and keeping it straight. The other thing that he doesn't mention is we're supposed to be looking at our finger. When we are sitting in that place, there had like we don't look down at the place of sujood. We look at the finger, and then when it comes to ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, you raise the finger. Uh, So once they raise it, they keep it like that? Yeah, yeah. No, no, so, so you would make it go down. Oh, they're like this? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah th this is also on it, one of the seven. Just in the Shafi'i method. So imagine all the other methods when we come to it. You do, you, yeah, this is... Yeah, for, for me, this the one I do is this one. And it usually is the first opinion mentioned in the madhab when they talk about the, the, the placing of uh, the finger. Um, so then he says, Ah. Do you ask for a position of you, you tap? I, I don't. That, so the opinion, this opinion, you don't tap. You point and then you let it go back. And you're in a good spot. No, your hands are like this. Like yeah. So the whole time the hand stays like this. Okay. This is one of the seven opinion in the madhab. One of them is a person starts like this. So both hands begin like this. Then at the time of pointing, go like this and then go back. And then another is, starts like this, point and stay like this until the end. And so, so many others. So many others. Let's make it uh, 
And then also the, the you know, the whole time going like this, uh, this is actually the second opinion. Is the difference related to minimizing movements in prayer? Not, not minimizing movements in prayer. It's, it's, so all of these, they have uh, authentic reports from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So because of that, and like, this is one of the places where they don't try to say that these are things that became abrogated. They just accept it and since it is part of like the, the these are not the branches of Salah. These are the, le the leaves of the Salah. And you have so many of the leaves that if even one was to like, one, a person was to go like this, then khalas, it will be like the breath. The, that leaf is not going to affect the rest of the prayer. Uh, uh, let's say you finish reciting the charge of the before the Imran finishes. Mm -hmm. At that point, do you just still point? Do you keep it? Do you keep it? So, so I, just, I, I keep it like this the whole time. The whole time. The whole time in the, like in this opinion, you just, you would go like this, right? And then, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And then you'd bring it back down. Obviously, with the one of the messages, also. And then you'd bring it down and you, you just wait until to finish. All right, that's how it would, uh, it would go. And this is the opinion of Al-Qadi for us here. Um, the next one he says, وَالِفْتِرَاشُ فِي جَمِيعِ الْجَلْسَاتِ That when you are sitting down, in every single type of sitting, you do what is called Al-Iftirash. Al-Iftirash is a person takes the left leg and he bends it this way and he sits on top of it and the right leg is going to stay up. Not the right leg, the right feet. So the right foot would go like this, like this. The left would be like this, and the sitting would be done on here. So in all of the sitting, a person would do a liftaraj. Except he says, وَالتَّوَرُّكْ fi jalsatil الْأَخِيرَةِ That in the last sitting, you would do what is a tawarruk. A tawarruk is, you, you are like this, now you would take this feet and you would put it inside. And you would sit on the ground and not on your feet. We know how to do these two? No khas. Huh? Demonstrate, you want to demonstrate Makes sense. No, I think we got it, sir. We've seen it enough. We are, mashallah, no kids in here. So we've seen this happen. Uh, yes. So do we do that? I've seen intermittent people do that sitting, you know, it's a four-up right? Yes. Yeah. So you would do it because that's, that is the last sitting even there. But I'll tell you what I personally do. So I get the, the yeah, there's some only in, in more than if there's multiple sittings. But I'll tell you guys what I personally do when it comes to this. If I pray at the masjid, I would not do tawarruq. It, I, I hate praying next to people that do that because all of a sudden they're on me now and I can't focus in my prayer. So because I don't like that, when I am praying in jama'ah, I'm not going to do that. But if I'm leading or if I'm praying by myself, I will, I'll do a tawarruk during the last sitting. There's not enough space, especially the way that... Our first line brothers, mashallah. This is, this is a hate. Yes. Doesn't, as far as like, it doesn't you know, destroy the salah. No. It, it's it, the more of these that you do, the less likely you have of messing up your salah. So the more like the the more you move away from just doing the the pillars of salah, the less likely you become of having deficiencies inside of the salah. But here, like in these type where it's talking about like a type of sitting, the reward is going to be the same. Whether you sit properly, I think I think in jama'ah, if you sit the other way, you actually get more reward. You won't bother the people next to you. Both ways, you're so it's either they're poking you with their toes from one side, or they're leaning too much on you from the other side, or they're stepping on you. So they're doing something, and now my khushu entirely is gone. I can't think about prayer. The other one is uh, the second taslim. So the second assalamu alaikum. The first one, Salah ends, the second one is Sunnah. The first one, Salah ends, the second one is Sunnah. There's a few times where brothers, uh, usually if you see me pray, uh, and the Imam says, Assalamu Alaikum, the first one, 
I usually just get up right away if I have an extra rak'ah to make. There are some people that find that uh, problematic and tell me, you know, I should wait until uh, Salah is finished, my brother. Let me get up and continue what I missed, huh? I mean, I've, I've seen it where people do it for regular, regular Salah, the two Mm-hmm. Janazah is one. So, right. ja, ja, so ja, ja, janazah in uh, for for everything for every salah is just one. It's just one is what's required to finish. The second it's sunnah. I don't think I've seen MCA do one salah. I mean one salah, one taslim. Yeah, in in, in in our countries you see that a lot. They just do one time. I've seen it on YouTube, mashallah. No, no, and and even in the haram when you do, they do one salah, one just one taslim. Like the salah is over now. But uh, here, I think they always do too. Tayyip, any questions up yeah. to here? Ah. All right, so going back to the point where uh, at Tamir, you said it changes to uh, elevates when we need to follow the Imam, but what usually happens is... We don't know. We, the... we say it and the Imam follows us. No, no, so, so, uh, so this is the other problem. We are supposed to say Amin as soon as we finish reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. The problem with the imams are they, they, for some reason, they wait. When they wait, we do what we're supposed to do, right? But the best is that as soon as you say, Wala ameen. As, an imam or as, an as the imam and also as the ma'mum, because what you are racing for, right? What you want, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the malaika pray with you. When you are praying, they pray with you. If your ameen matches with their ameen, your du'as are going to be answered. And the du'a that we are asking for is ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqeem. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. So we want to do it as soon as, like we want to try to match this ameen of ours with that of the malaika. And the malaika, they do it when they say, وَلَضَّالِينَ ameen. For some reason, the imams wait until everybody says ameen and then go ameen after. Inshallah, uh, Abdul Qadir, if you lead us one of these days, fix it for us, inshallah. Tayyip? Inshallah. I mean, as soon as we finish. That's what it is. The other thing, what uh, tawajjuh is uh, uh, the dua that a person makes in the beginning. What do we say? Rabbana wa alhamd. Allahu Akbar. What do we say? What's the dua we say? Allahu Akbar, mashallah, this is a Muslim pro one. <laughs> it's the extra religious brother here, mashallah. Huh? There's, there's a couple, but I know that it's like the one about the English language. Mashallah, an another advanced Muslim brother here. Who says the one we all say? I say the one that... Uh, the one that I can't remember except in Salah. <laughs> That's the one I say. <laughs> I can't remember until I do it. No, no. How is it gone from all of our minds? Yeah. I remember the rest of the time. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Wa tabaraka smuka wa ta'ala jidduka wa la ilaha ghayruka. There you go. Mashi zakum za khayr. Tayyip, any questions on the hayat? Oh, there's more we could add, by the way, but we'll stop with the 15 he's given us. Yes. Okay. If I, if I wait, like, if I am on time and I'm praying with the imam, as soon as he says, Assalamu alaikum, I'm saying my Assalamu alaikum. By that time, he should go on the other way and say, Assalamu alaikum, and then I follow him. Sometimes to be safe, you wait until, you know, he does both and then you just say it. Right? That's how you do it. But I just, as soon as Assalamu alaikum, I'm going to join him in saying that salams on it, as his head is turning this way, my, I'm going that way. But I, I, I know what you mean. You, you, you make those awkward ones and then the people are looking at you. <laughs> we all should be turning at one time so we don't look at each other and then turn towards this thing. And then it's so close, so you end up making eye contact. Like, uh, so, uh, we're supposed to follow the Imam every single day. And if the Hayyat is not finished, and he says, he said, did I finish? Did I finish? Or do I also follow you? No, you finish and then you say it. So, okay, in, in, interesting thing. I think I don't think we talked about it when we recited Surah Al-Fatiha. When we were talking about Surah Al-Fatiha, the Shafi'i Madhab allows you to be less than two steps behind the Imam, less than two steps of prayer behind the Imam. 
So meaning, if I am recite, if I decided I'm going to recite Surah Al-Fatiha when he goes into Ruku', and I begin reciting it, and he comes up from Ruku', before he goes down, I can still be standing before going into Ruku'. So if he goes down, then I ha I'll go into Ruku'. When he comes up, before he goes back down to the second sujood, I need to be at least caught up with the first sujood. So they allow less than, being less than two behind the Imam. So in this instance of him saying, Assalamu Alaikum, and I didn't finish my tashahud, there's no other step, so you have a little bit of time to um, finish your uh, tashahud and then give your salams. Wrap up the duas that you're making and then give the salams. That's how it would be. Um, I would say be careful of the other times. Right? Our, our imams, mashallah, we have, uh, mashallah, they, they are, uh, we, we run in salah, Allah. So you have to be very careful. And, you, and if you go more than two steps, the salah is broken. That's what it means. And you'd have to start again. Mm -hmm. the, they, uh, the, no, the number is different. The number is different. It will say one. It can be more than one behind. So here the interesting thing is less than two, right? Less than two allows like for some transition to what do you call like the next part of the salah. And those that say one is if the imam gets up from ruku' and you're not in ruku' yet, then it, it would go over there. It would end at that point. But less for, for it being less than two means he could come up from ruku before you're in. But you just before he goes to sujood, you have to you have to be in ruku. So just the num numbers are a little bit. Uh, a lot of people make the imam is in ruku. Mm -hmm. Run, right? And then as the imam is getting up, then they have a lot of them. Yeah, if if the imam got up from ruku, you did not catch the rakah. Mm -hmm. If you did not enter the salah before he gets up from ruku. Before he makes the statement, Sami Allahu liman hamida, even if you run and you go into, it doesn't count as a, as a rak'ah. And again, one of the things, we should never run to salah. We should never hurry to catch salah. You could do what I do when the Imam is ruku, I start dangling my keys. <laughs> Hopefully he hears the dangling of the key and he's like, let me make this a little bit longer. You know, but sometimes... You don't get a chance to say even once, you have a good That's fine. So tasbih is from the hayat of salah, even if you say zero times. Just last week, when I went through the analysis, I made sure that he has two times. You were saying you should have to want Nina in order to catch that. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that. <laughs> uh, two is crazy. The, uh, hearing yourself when we're in salah, uh -huh. when you're in the mouth. Every time. To get out of them, I, I hate this. So. <laughs> yeah, so so the whole the idea of al jahr wa sir is is because it's from the hayat of salah, the, like the best practice. And you could tell usually if you go to the masjid and you stand next to somebody, and they're like you could hear their recitation in a in a salah that is supposed to be quiet. Just know this is this is a hard line Shafi'i brother right here, standing next to you, right? Because for them like this, the idea of being able to hear yourself, and when they mean hear yourself is not internally. So you actually have to hear it from here to here, right? So because of that, they would do it. But ideally is that we just, we recite it to where we can hear without words coming out. So you could hear it internally. And I know that, like I'm, no one next to me should hear. And that's how it should be. Yeah, but, the, but if you see them do it, just. If you're doing it with your lips, uh -huh. sometimes you see them massage and they're like breath chirping. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're doing something That's why the sub hisma sounds like that. Yeah, it's what it's in the middle. No, the tasbih, that's why it sounds like that, huh? It's what it's in the Uh huh. Like, MashaAllah. While you're reading quietly, you read Nas after. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> I just, I just let the Imam decide what he's reading for us, eh? Fatiha <laughs> only. No, no, but you should, like, we should understand that, you know, we don't want to bother the salah of the people around us, right? Uh, so what if I know the Imam is fast and I'm not going to 
Do I try to start? Yes, start, yeah. But then just stop at the next verse where you could go down. Me, I, 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 if... Do I recite another surah? If I'm praying Dhuhr and Asr, most likely I don't recite another surah. I recite my Fatiha and I just wait for the Imam to, inshallah, figure out the rest for us. <laughs> That's what I do. I, I don't think I, I can't... If I read, then... then <laughs> What if you're reading it there, as long as words, right? Yeah. You know you're never going to be able to finish it. Yeah, you still don't start it, brother. What if it's Surah? What if you are? Then? Even if it's, so Surah Al-Fatiha for us, we have to read it. So what happens if like, you, you join the Salah right before he goes into the Ruku? You go into Ruku with him okay. that time. Because you are catching the Ruku. But what if you don't have a chance to read Surah Yeah, that's fine. If you're catching the Raka'ah, then the, you've caught the Raka'ah. If you catch the Ruku. Even if you don't, even if you don't recite Fatiha. But if you join from the, you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Any, any other questions here? Ah, uh, is it? Uh, can you walk me through uh, when you read Surah al Because there's no time between Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah al Again, first, we have to complain to the Imams. That's the first part. You're like, inshallah, give us time to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And the Imams that we pray behind are not Hanafi, so we know for a fact we have to read Surah Al-Fatiha. So we say, hey, let's uh, give us time. Personally, it depends on who's leading the Salah for me. Most I read with the Surah Al-Fatiha with them, or I read after they finish. That's what I do. So it's fine to read after. While they're reading it. Yeah. And the hadith they use for this comes from Abu Hurairah. I think from Abu Hurairah. The Prophet وسلم, is leading the companions in Salah and he hears them repeating after him. Right? So they like he's reciting and he could hear their recitation of the verses he's reading. So he goes to them after Salah and he says, do you repeat after the Imam? They said, yes. Prophet وسلم, said, don't do that except for Surah Al-Fatiha. Right? And like this is, you know, the hadith at the top for why we need to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Of course, the other, so, the other hadith where it says, لَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأْ فَاتِحَةِ الْكِتَابِ There's no salah for the person that did, did not recite Surah Al-Fatiha, right? So the best time, the, you have three places. Try to read it before they begin reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Try to read it after they finish reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. And then try to read it after they've done the recitation of, uh, like of that second Surah that they're reading. In our time, it becomes very difficult. Very few Imams where, like there are some times where I would read a few verses before they begin Fatiha. A few more verses in between them finishing Fatiha. And then I'll finish as soon as they finish. This becomes very difficult where it's just continuation of recitation and then automatically into Ruku. So when I know that's going to happen, I generally just recite while they're reciting uh, Fatiha. Just recite with them. Any other questions here? Tayyib, Bismillah, read for us. I'll keep to here. Um, so he says, مَا تُخَالِفُ الْمَرْأَةُ فِيهِ الرَّجُلُ in Salah, what are the things that women do differently than men? The things that women do differently than men. He says there are five things. When he mentions these five, he's going to tell you what men do. And there are some, actually later he'll tell you what, the, what they're supposed to do. But he says there are five. The first one, it is that men, when they are going into uh, sujood, when they are in sujood and also in ruku, they're... Stomach has to be separated from their thighs. It has to be apart from one another. There can't be touching. Then he says, after that, in the places of jahriya, in the places that we're supposed to recite out loud, you would recite out loud. And if he is being led and something is missing from the salah, meaning the imam makes a mistake, he would, he would do tasbih to tell them a mistake has been made, 
which would be uh, Subhanallah, not Allahu Akbar, not La ilaha illallah, just Subhanallah. Then the other one he says, وَعَوْرَةُ الرَّجُلْ مَا بَيْنَ سُرَّتِهِ وَرُكْبَتِهِ What is required for the man to cover when he is in salah it is what? Between the navel and the knees. We will say above the navel to below the knees. That's what it is. These are uh, these are the things that are different from a man and a woman. Ah. The knees? Yeah, yeah, no. The the aura needs to be covered from from the moment we leave our homes until we go back to our homes. <laughs> let's let's just not stop it at salah. Actually, this is the aura that needs to be covered. Tayyib, if we are playing sports in shorty shorts, make tawbah. If you are playing, <laughs> like, wallah, it's la hawla la billah. May Allah make it easy, we'll just say that. Okay? Uh, so th those are the places that are different for men. Now he'll tell us what women are supposed to do in the places that he just told us. Um, uh, he, the other things for rajul, yujafi mirfaqihi, when he's making sujood, he will remove the elbows uh, away from his body. Okay? If you're praying alone, you could go all the way out. If you're praying with people, just separate it a little bit. <laughs> ya Allah. <laughs> ya Allah. <laughs> Some of the brothers, mashallah, are very dedicated to this. Huh? Allah, you have to look for a place to make sujood. You don't know if you're facing the Qibla properly because he decided he's going to go like, what are you doing, man? Babe, uh, read the next part for us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He says, for the women, now the places that are different. She says, he says, she needs to bring in salah her body together. So the places where we said we would separate, they should be together. There are also some here, again, these five that he mentions. These are the five of the Shafi'i Madhab. The number also changes as you, you know, what scholar in the madhab is writing this. There are some madhab that can count up to 19 different things that a woman is supposed to do in salah to the men. But here, these five are like the, the, the majority five that you could find in every madhab. So the idea of bringing the, the body together is one. Then he says that she lowers her voice in the places that she would typically read out loud if they are men that are uh, ajanib, men that are uh, strangers. We'll say uh, non mahams non Okay, question. Would she, uh, does she have to lower her voice in front of her husband? If we say non, all non mahams and salah. So it says ajanib. So that ajanib, he said, we're going to say non mahrams. So is, is a husband, is ajnabi to his wife? Of course not, huh? Okay, but is he a mahram to her? What is, what is a mahram? Oh, uh, mahram is a person who. Khalas, then the husband cannot be a mahram, right? That, that wouldn't, that would, there you go, mahrams plus husband, right? Uh, huh. So they, they would still be considered ajanib, even the temporary ones. Because they, they are, they are like, she said, uh, like your sister's husband. That's what you said, sir? Your sister's husband. So the, the, the mahrams, the mahrams, there are two types. There's one that is permanent, where the status of being a mahram will never be removed. And then there are some that have a time limit to how long they are your mahram for. And those are, for example, the husband of your sister is only a mahram as long as he is the husband of your sister. If he does not, 
if that changes, then he cannot be a mahram. Or the husband of your aunt, or the wife of your uncle, or the, uh, right? The wife of the uncle is not a mahram. She's a limited time mahram. Those that are limited do not have the same rulings as the permanent maharim. They do not have the same rulings. They have, it, it's, it's the only thing that is different between them and people that are ajanib is one. You can't marry them. That's the only thing. Everything else, they would be considered men and women that are uh, strangers. So everything you would do to, like, for example, uh, my sister, she is a permanent mahram. I can see the hair of my sister. My brother's wife, she is a part-time or temporary mahram. <laughs> On the weekend, huh? part I can never see her hair like that. That makes sense? Um, so in the t if there's men that are ajanib, in the places that she should be reading, she should lower her voice. She should lower her voice. The next one, وَإِذَا نَابَهَا شَيْءٌ فِي الصَّلَاةِ نَابَهَا شَيْءٌ If something is missing in her salah, not in, her, in the salah of the imam that is leading, what she has to do is safaqat. What is safaqat? You clap, your salah is finished. Okay? There we go. That's why I shouldn't have asked the men. What to, it started going like this. <laughs> All right. What you do is you take the, uh, the inside and hit the outside. So clapping of the outside. All right. Even though even this is also the same words. Huh? But this is a salah of the people of Jahiliyyah. The clapping in prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُهُمْ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا بُكَاءً وَتَصْفِيَةً Right, their salah in the house it was just screaming and the clapping of the hands. Huh. Uh, I've heard scenarios of some of someone, some woman instead of clapping, mm -hmm. suffering, yeah, you uh, is saying subhanallah. Mm -hmm. uh, problematic? Not, not in our madhab. In our madhab, if, if she says subhanallah and uh, the man instead hits his head, that's, that doesn't uh, break the thing. But if a person was to do something else, then those two. And that, you know, very interesting ones, there's ones, you know, hit your thighs. So, you know, here, like this is intended to be loud for the person to know, okay, I've made a mistake, either in recitation or in an increase or in a decrease of the salah. And that's when you would say, like we would say, subhanAllah. In the masjid, whenever you see this masjid, the whole adhkar is said. <laughs> you know, subhanAllah, Allah Akbar, la ilaha illallah, khalas. The, if, uh, Half the masjid is standing, uh, mashallah. Tayyib, any questions up to here? Oh, actually, we uh, the awrah. So he says, the awrah for a woman that is free, it is everything except her face and her hands. Everything except her face and her hands. Everything else is awrah. But he says for the amma, for the slave, for the uh, slave woman, her awrah is like that of a man. Her awrah is like that of a man. So she would cover, and here, um, let's, uh, let's take a few minutes to talk about this. Huh? This only applies in front of people that are the maharim, that would be considered the maharim to her. Her awrah is like that of men. But if it's in front of other people, the awrah of the free woman and the slave woman is the same. The awrah of the free woman and the woman that is a slave is the same. We don't have this in our times. So there's uh, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we don't have this in our time. But this is how they would be. And this is like they, they, they in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu just because the aura of the slave was like that of men, it didn't mean we had a bunch of people just walking around naked. That's not what it meant. Right? And like for them, the aura of what they would show when, for example, someone would come to marry them and so on, they would, uh, it would be that of the man. And even with that, the the chest and the back would also still be covered. Any questions here? Uh. When it comes to, uh, uh, like, when you go to the gym, for example, and you're mm -hmm. in the changing, you see guys like taking off their shirt, and obviously you can see below their naked, but they're still let's say wearing like, like shorts or whatever. Don't ever go in the gym. The locker, la hawla wa la By the way, by the way, 
seeing the aura of a person, seeing the aura of a person that you are not allowed to see. Some scholars consider it from the kabair, from the major sins that a person commits. For both men and women. The aura is something that a people that are not supposed to see it, not allowed to see it, should never see it. Uh, a question? Yes, um, concerning the bringing the body close together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like no, so so you so you would do the same, but what they usually talk about when they say ruku is that a woman would bend her knees, while a man would keep the knees straight, right? So a man would keep like, like he would be like this, but they usually when they talk about like this coming together, they bring they the knees would be bent, so you would actually like like you would go a little bit lower, but that would be because the knees are bending, not because your back is going. Uh, Further down. And then so they should do it in their stomach, such as their thighs? Yes. And then also, he, d he doesn't mention here, but the, the hands go on the ground also. So the hands, the forearms would go on the ground themselves. Like, mm -hmm. for men, it wouldn't go on the ground. Right? And all of this to, uh, for the sake of uh, Haya. So this is for it. Ah. For for women, it's it's it's, uh, it's there. For women, for men, it is not. You're not supposed to put your uh, here on it. Um, now, uh, if she, wherever they, these, wherever she's praying, yeah. The other also the thing that I don't think he mentioned here, um, it's that the hand is not held together, but it's just placed there. So it would be placed like this. Like it would be placed on top. It wouldn't be the grabbing that men would do. That's not mentioned here. Any other questions? Huh? No. Connecting the email, let's say, you ask questions to say what hanging out with doesn't realize what mistake he's done. Yeah. Then what do you do? If you see Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, he's doing it. So he said the question is if we are correcting the Imam, and he doesn't know what we are correcting him for. There are places where it's like there's an excuse for them that. If we attempted to fix it, we just ignore it and we continue to do what he does. For example, if he gets up in the second tashahud without sitting down, don't even say subhanallah there. Just let him get up, you get up with him. Because if he goes from standing to down, salah is broken. What we want to clap our hands for is, let's say, he missed a ruku'ah. He missed a ruku'ah. So we would say subhanallah. And let's say he doesn't understand what he has done. He forgot that he only made one sujood. And he continues sitting, somebody has to tell them, hey, I have to make sujood. Because our salah is like suspended at that moment. And that sujood needs to, it turned around. That, that sujood needs to be made, right? That sujood needs, that second sujood, or the ruku' needs to be made. And then once they're made, either we tell them subhanallah and he knows it, and then he goes to it. If he doesn't, someone has to tell him there's this missing sujood. And for that, for that, inshallah, that person, the salah will not be broken. Any questions? Any other questions here? Tayyip, should we get into the things that break the salah? No. No? No, because that's the Oh, yes. Oh, it's actually very small. Bismillah, go quickly. <laughs> الكلام العمد والعمل الكثير والحدث وحدوث النجاسة وانكشاف العوضة وتغيير النية واستدبار الصلة والأكل والشرب والقهقهة والردة طيب uh, the things that break the salah of a person the things that break the salah of a person and if the salah if any of these happen in the salah you cannot continue the salah there's no continuation of the salah so he says there are 11 things the first one it is speech on purpose, speaking on purpose. Here, if you speak accidentally, we speak accidentally and it's very small. And what they consider small is for the returning of the salam. So let's say I'm in salah for some reason, somebody comes in, says, Assalamu Alaikum. And I say to him, Wa Alaikum Assalam. My salah, if I didn't do this on purpose, 
it is not going to break. It is not going to break. Also, there are certain verses in the Quran that a person could recite to where it would be like speaking and he's intending with it the speech, but it would not break the salah of a person. Example, <laughs> you want, uh, your kid is running around, you want him to grab something or pick up something and you say, yeah, Yahya, khud al kitab bi right? Intending with it, oh, take this with you, like take, hold it. It wouldn't break the salah and other verses like that. But any person that for, speaks on purpose, even if it is less than assalamu alaikum, the salah is broken. The other thing he says, وَالْعَمَلُ كَثِيرٌ A lot of actions in the salah. Actions that are considered outside of what we have covered. If he does it too much, the salah is broken. So our brother earlier says some of the brothers do this. If you do this like one time, two times, it's fine. That third and fourth time, you might have broken your salah. Or heavy movements, unnecessary. One of them, and people don't realize this, some of our brothers that don't pray with a thobe on, they have to keep adjusting themselves every time they go into ruku, every time they go into sujood. If this is done with two hands and it's a big pull up, khalas, salah has broken. So that's what they consider al-amal kathir. It could be a lot of small movements that you keep doing. So this, this, you know, whatever, like the itching, a lot of it can break your salah. And a lot, usually to them, more than three. That's what it means. Oh, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Looking is, uh, ya Allah. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the people that look around in salah, the people that look around in salah, maybe Allah will take away their eyesight. In another one, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when you begin prayer, you have turned towards Allah. And Allah will continue to turn towards you until you turn away. And the turning away is what uh, people do this. Wallahi, sometimes people look at you until you feel ashamed that you look away. Wallahi, you have to be the one that's looking away. And they just look at what is going on there? Tayyip, okay. And then he says, well, hadath. What is hadath? Bismillah. Al hadath here means anything that breaks wudu. So all of anything that breaks you wudu breaks the salah. If it happens while you're praying. And then he says, um, najasa coming. Either somebody, for example, coming and, and, and urinating on you or um, substances that are najis touching you or touching the place that you're praying and so on. Or them coming from you yourself, uh, it's going to break uh, your salah. The other one, one kishaf al The awra being uncovered, the awra being uncovered, your salah is broken. At any point in the salah, if the awra is broken, if, if the awra is uncovered, your salah is broken. In the madhab, the only like asterisk that they put when it comes to the covering of the awra is that sometimes if the, you see the, the uh, you have your heel, right? And then you see the line that comes out of it, like the, the, this back of the feet, back of the knee. If for a sister, when she gets up from sujood, that place becomes exposed. A little bit of it, that does not break the, the, the salah. That does not break the salah. So like the back of, of over here, just a little bit, a little bit above the ankles. If it, if it becomes uncovered, it will not break the salah. But for men, if any of your aura is shown, if you go, if you... When you wear shorts and you pray salah and you're in uh, sujood and we see your thighs, mashallah, you have to pray this one again. What if you see like the middle of your face? The middle, that's what, here, if you can... The only reason I ask is because I feel like it's common, I've seen it a lot of times, like the brothers will wear shorts. And then pull it down, huh? It just covers a little. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't cover like the bottom of your actual... So the philosophy that we should be having when it comes to shorts, is if it if it does not co cover the entire knee when it comes to the time of prayer at one of the movements that you do it will uncover like w if, without a doubt it will uncover so if that is going to happen and it does happen your salah is broken this is 
And then you see on this. No, no, brothers, brothers, brothers. Fear Allah. Fear Allah. This is your salah. The first thing you'll be held accountable for on the day of judgment. What we need to do is, you guys ever been to those masajids? Where like on the woman's side, they have, uh, uh, they have like a, a, the abayas and the hijabs. That's what we need to do for the men. Just put those on the side. Or put, you know, the, uh, the bish that you could cover yourself with, huh? We should, but that's not going to stop us, right? There's a lot of things we shouldn't be doing, but that's what they're doing. So we should have that for the men that come to the masjid. And then cover yourselves. So this is awrah in general. The worst awrah from the awrah is not the same, right? You have like, if again, our awrah is being uncovered, very bad. The worst is the most private of the places of the awrah is being uncovered. And unfortunately in salah for men, this is what gets uncovered the most. Not even like the, the, the excusable you know, places, the worst places get uncovered. So cover yourselves properly when you pray as salah. Uh, yeah, Allah, if the, if the Imam is leading us and he's not wearing a thobe, oh, no, like just, just uh, if you're at home and you're not covering your awrah, my brother, okay. what's happening? Let's see, let's see you're praying with your roommate. You're praying with your roommate. I, I don't know. There's no problem with <laughs> <laughs> is there, He said, is there a problem with a, an Imam not wearing a thobe? If we are together, there's no problem. But at the masjid, I don't know. At the masjid, I, 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 I'm I, like, yeah, Allah, there's going to for sure be deficiencies in this salah. There's, there's you, yeah, Allah. Uh, we have to become like our Hanafi brothers where if somebody leaves without a kufi, forget the thawb. <laughs> they'll come and they'll put it on top of him. <laughs> yeah, like this is good. Uh -huh. And then the handful, you got to have a handful here. Huh? Oh, eh? Can't just let anybody be leading us to Salah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue. Um, and then he says, niyyah, The changing of the niyyah. If your niyyah changes, what happens is sometimes people will enter Salah and they will tell the, themselves, as, if somebody comes in, I will leave the Salah. At that moment, the Salah has broken. Or, I actually don't want to pray anymore. Right, I actually don't want to pray anymore. Salah is finished. So if the niyyah changes, the salah is broken. But if a niyyah goes from fard to sunnah, if you change your intentions, I, I like it, it happens sometimes, I begin praying fajr, and then I realize I could make it to the masjid. So I tell myself, you know what, this is, I'm going to downgrade this to a sunnah. That does not break it. The other way, it breaks it. So if I begin sunnah and tell myself, you know what, actually I'm going to do fard. <laughs> <laughs> you prayed neither, actually. That's what happened to you. Uh, any questions here? So the changing of the niyyah. Uh, the other one is turning away with tidbarul qibla. Turning away from the qibla or turning your back towards the qibla breaks the salah. So for some reason, if you do a 180 salah, khalas, just walk out now. Um, eating breaks the salah. Eating breaks the salah. Drinking breaks the salah. Again, there's very small amounts that are excusable. Small amounts that are excusable for these two things. But one thing that you must avoid is if you have like food particles in your mouth, if you swallow it in salah, this is considered eating. So if for some reason your tongue decides to go on an adventure and find the pieces from your last meal, and then you tell yourself, just go enjoy the full meal now, huh? Uh, if for some reason there's very good coffee. To drink. Oh, it's just uh, finish the salah, go drink, and come back inside. Right? There's uh, eating and drinking break the. If you drink, your khalas is done. Salah is finished. <laughs> right? If you just go. You really want to break the You don't want to keep the streak going, huh? Now you just start over. Ah. So, so, no, no, this, this is what I would like, just move back and push somebody forward. Move back, let somebody else lead. And this is why, like, the, you know, the, the place, the standing that we do in salah is very important. Especially when we, we pray in jama'ah. Typically, the person that needs to stand behind the imam 
has to be the second most knowledgeable person there so that in case the Imam for some reason doesn't, can continue, he will just step up. I think recently in the Haram this happened, right? Uh, Sheikh Mahir was, was leading Jum'ah and he kind of like, he, he couldn't continue and he fainted. So today he's just stepped up and continued reading. So he was, he's the right, he's right behind him. So, and he started his Fatiha from Ihdina uh, Sarat al Mustaqim. So, and this happened, I think, last week or something. Right? Last week, right? So, you just, you will push somebody just forward. Um, so, that's eating uh, and drinking. The next one is Al Qahqaha. What is Qahqaha? <laughs> laughing loudly. There are some that took, take this and they say it even breaks your wudu. That if you laugh in salah, forget breaking the salah, your wudu is batal. You are such shaitan that. Major Najis has come to go and make wudu again. But it, it is, if you laugh in salah, small, big, it breaks the salah. The last one. Uh, what about like a so if you don't make noise and you just smile, that doesn't break. Like for qahqaha, sound comes out. So even if it's like a small. <laughs> oh, they're not praying salah. All right? May Allah not put us in places like that. The last one and the most interesting out of all of it is Arida. <laughs> Leaving Islam, Islam breaks your salah. Huh? <laughs> Ajeeb, right? They have to, it's so in every, like even when we talk about Hajj, when we talk about fasting, they will always mention Arida. And I've always thought to myself, someone does not become a murtad in salah. Like we don't think of him becoming a murtad while he's praying salah or while he's in Hajj, or while he's fasting. We think that Ridda comes at different times. But what they are talking about here is not this like this Ridda of announcement. But if you have like inside of you, like you've, you, you make up your mind that, you know what, I'm done with this religion. As you're praying Salah, you're done at that moment. May Allah protect us from it. But a Ridda is everywhere. I think even in wudu, we talked about it, it's from the mutila. If wudu itself, it breaks it. Someone that becomes a murtad, he has broken his wudu. And he'll have to, and I'm pretty sure we talked about it. Tayyib, uh, we are, uh, question. question. Um, I've seen a lot of people that are standing and praying, so like, have a tendency to put forward and take back to the that If you see them do it a few more times, be like, yeah. Uh, for, forget that, uh, the Imams, the Imams, uh, here Alhamdulillah the mic is, is like, is attached like this or it's attached to it. Some masjid you go to where the, the uh, like it's a standing mic. And the Imams, he, they would get up from sujood and they have to avoid, they have to avoid the mic. So they go like this, they avoid the mic and they step back and then when it's time to recite, they step forward. They do that a few too many times, nobody's praying salah. Huh. This is also fireworks in the sense like, I know there's, there's a spin up when you're doing the Qiyam and then you're reciting with the Quran in your hand. Mm -hmm. Obviously that requires more of those to put it down, put it to the side of the table, pick it up, pull it from the pages, etc. Yeah. So is that also applied in the same degree to sinners as it is to it, ap it applies the same way. There shouldn't be too much movement. But when it comes to holding the Mus'haf, you want to do as little movement as possible. So get a small Mus'haf that you could read like this, close and still hold here when you go into Ruhu, when you go into Sujood and hold it. Just hold it here, so with the one hand. One hand, go like this. Yeah, you're praying Sunnah, so... so. We say you have to hold the Qur'an, but if you're going like this and this, khalas, just... Read Qulhu Allah a hundred times, same thing. Ah. Um, what about like adjusting towards yourself when you're standing? Like in PM or in general or something? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it, are you counting like how much further adjusting yourself? Like if I were to just push my legs to the right a little bit, yeah. so that's one, and then I'm stopping and I'm in that position for a little bit? Uh -huh. Or is it like, oh, I had to like adjust my standing five times? So if you're doing it for a purpose, like if, if, if it's I'm adjusting myself, you wouldn't count it as being unnecessary movements. But if I'm like, 
you, you know, usually when it comes to like the scratching, this is what people do most, right? The first time, there's a reason for it. Like I felt something, so I decided to go like this. But the way shaitan works is now he knows you did this. He'll give you one here, give you one here. So you're just like moving around. That's what is too much. But for example, if a hole is, is opened in the sufuf, in the lines, and you decide to move forward, you're doing a lot of movements that would not break the salah because this, there's a need for you to do this. And because there's a need for you to do it, um, you wouldn't do, uh, you wouldn't, uh, like, it, it wouldn't count, like, it wouldn't count as that, that, that is going to break the salah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah that's, so that's what he was asking, this leaning. Do not lean too much. Do not lean too much in the salah. Don't go forward, don't go back. Like, this is, it's not a rocking chair, my brothers. It's stand. Yeah, yeah some, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I do. Well, like with those, we have to be very careful. We have to be very, very careful. Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, he once saw a man praying salah. And he would do these movements. And then he said, this is a man of nifaq. This is a, a man of nifaq. So they asked him, how? He's moved with the words that he's reciting. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never intended the words that we recite to move our bodies. What is intended is that our hearts are moving. So while he's going like this and he's going back and forth, his heart is not doing anything. There's no movement of it. So this is like how you could tell. So we want to be very, very careful that sometimes when the Imam recites in certain ways or recites certain verses, there are people that, that begin moving. We have to make sure this movement is accompanied with the movement of the heart and not just the body moving. Allah make it easy for us. Any other questions? Um, uh, with this, we are going to finish. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for shortcomings. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.